Welcome to tonight's presentation. 1938, what was it like in West, what was life like in West Bloomfield? Celebrating the West Bloomfield Township Public Library's 75th anniversary, 1938. They asked us to give this presentation and that's why we're here this evening. This is one of many events planned by the library celebrating their anniversary. I'm Gina Gregory, president of the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society and will give tonight's presentation. Before we begin, I'd like to point out our upcoming events. Saturday, October 12th is a morning brunch with a focus on the Civil War. Please see our fall newsletter with the blue sheet for this activity and others. On the table by the door are Save the Date flyers for our historic homes tour, which is coming up next June in 2014. Also on your chair is an evaluation form. Please let us know your thoughts about tonight's presentation. On this beige form, you can request to learn more about the organization as well. And then please know we are always looking for new volunteers and yellow volunteer information bookmarks are by the table at the door. Now on to tonight's program. 1938. What was it like, well, let me start again. 1938, what was life like in Greater West Bloomfield? The presentation is by Gina Gregory, Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society, and Danny Mann of West Bloomfield Civic Center TV. This is sponsored by Civic Center TV, Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society, and the West Bloomfield Library. This is an overlook at West Bloomfield in the up to the 1938 era, knowing that there are always more questions to answer and that additional research increases our understandings. We'll see how area geography influenced development as people have always appreciated lakes. We'll look at the aspects of daily living through recent interview videos. We are located on, in a glacial moraine. 25 lakes cover 1,860 acres, or 14% of our 36 square miles. We have more lakes and ponds than any other township in, in the United States, except for one in Minnesota. This area is the headwaters of three watersheds, Huron, Clinton, and Rouge Rivers. American Indians used rivers as water highways. With Apple Island located in the middle of Orchard Lake and near the headwaters of the three rivers, this was an easy meeting place. There were two American Indian reservations here when white settlers migrated to West Bloomfield. One reservation was on, the Ap was on Apple Island and another was a 107 acre plot on the south side of Orchard Lake. This is a, an enlargement of a portion of the 1817 land office survey map covering West Bloomfield. Three triangular symbols and the word Indian huts mark a Native American encampment on the northeast shore of Orchard Lake. From census reports, we learn 1900 saw a population of about 1,000, 1910 about 1,100, 1920 about 2,000, 1930 about 3,500, and 1940 about 5,600. Now watch the Oakland County's, how Oakland County's population grew using filed Oakland County records. I think it's done. 
The historical society looks at development as having four phases, American Indians, farmers, vacationers, and suburbanites. The 1930s saw farms, vacationers, and residential use. In the 1820s, settlers came to farm, especially from New York State, lured by the good soil, abundant water, and cheap land. Many came overland to Buffalo, and then by schooner to Detroit. On this 1896 map, you can see that all the homes in the area, or see all the homes in the area, illustrated as squares. Farming was the main occupation of West Bloomfield residents until the second half of the 20th century. Although, West Bloomfield, although the farms of West Bloomfield were very diverse, two would rise to the top, apples and sheep. The first would leave an indelible mark on the township's history, and the second would be all but forgotten. The last vestige of farming in West Bloomfield were the sheep that grazed on area farms. Sheep were significant as almost 40,000 pounds of wool were produced in the township in 1880. The Rambouillet breed was first introduced to the United States on a West Bloomfield farm at the southeast corner of Walnut Lake and Orchard Lake roads. You may remember the sheep grazing here through the 1980s. Does anybody remember that? Four, all right. Farming was important to the area for over 100 years. How was it living at a farm in the 1930s? Well, it was still rural, rural. Uh, nothing, uh, Everything was small, even the government was small. West Bloomfield was nothing. It was farms, there were, and you knew who each farm was, who it belonged to, and, and you were free. We went through the Greens Orchard to get to school, and people could do that, and there was no problem, because everybody knew each other. Uh, Had radio, no TV, daily paper. The only stoplight in West Bloomfield was at Maple and Orchard Lake Road. Really? And we crossed that road. We were taught you stop and watch both ways. And, but at five years old, I remember coming home by myself, crossing Orchard Lake Road. One of my uh, relatives was uh, the, the man who had the, or the green orchard on uh, Walnut Lake and Orchard Lake. And so I, I knew about that orchard. Greens we always think of as the big orchards. Um, my grandfather loved trees and he had several, planted several pear trees. We had cherry trees, we had apple trees, um, uh, just on our own farm. I picked on a, an orchard on Middle Belt. It was um, the Masons, the Masons owned it. And um, they had apples also, but I remember picking sweet cherries. Because I was a girl, I didn't have to milk cows, but um, they, were, they had to be milked in the morning, they had to be milked at night. And it was just exciting being in the barn when this is all going on. It was sort of our playhouse. We could go up in the upstairs and go up in the lofts and the wheat bins and the oat bins. And it was magic. It was, when I look at what we had, I can't believe it. Lured by the beauty of the area in the mid-1900s, people came here for schools, summer recreation, and year-round living. Two large hotels were on the shores of Orchard Lake and an excursion steamboat, the Dell, plied its waters. Inner Lake and Hotel was on Pine Lake. Vacationers came by Inner Urban and Railway. Upon retirement from the Michigan Supreme Court in 1858, Joseph Tyre Copeland 
built a retirement home, later referred to as the castle. The building was converted into a hotel in 1872 with the addition of two wings, wood construction, that would accommodate 100 guests. The right photo, the right photo illustrates this. From 1877 through 1908, the Michigan Military Academy incorporated the castle and built other buildings for a military college preparatory school. Even with its short history, the academy acquired an amazing academic record, and many of its graduates went on to distinguished careers. Then remodeling and new construction from 1912 through 1928 permitted further enrollment growth. Three distinct schools, SS Cyril and, Cyril and Methodius Seminary, St. Mary's College, and St. Mary's Preparatory emerged from the restructuring of the seminary in 1927 through 28, each with a four-year program and are still in operation today. From this wayside exhibit, part of a recent project through Motor City's Heritage, Nas uh, National Heritage Area with MDOT and the National Park Service, we learn what is now the West Bloomfield Trail was once a rail bed of the Grand Trunk Railroad, built through the region in the 1880s to serve agriculture and industry. Also, a light rail electric trolley track was built in 1899 and served communities from Pontiac through Farmington to Detroit and later became part of the larger Detroit United Railway. Transportation transformed the landscape of rural West Bloomfield as electronic trolleys and automobiles appeared around the turn of the 20th century. Many people traveled here for the first time from Detroit and Pontiac, and real estate developers sold lakefront lots. By 1938, the trains were no longer in use as automobiles became affordable for the middle class. On Sylvan Lake, Merrill B. Mills built the Sylvan Lake Inn in 1893. It included a dance pavilion, bowling alley, billiard parlor, and riding stables. Sadly, it burned to the ground in 1903. By trolley and automobiles, people visited Sylvan Lake at Tower Beach on the Telegraph Road side of the lake for slide rides, picnics, fishing, and swimming. See all of the summer development in the upper right photo. Kego Harbor was advertised as a vacation haven. Again, we see as automobiles became affordable to the middle class, development furthered and summer cottages were built. On the left is a traffic jam at Wilkins Corner, a store and a gas station, at Pontiac Trail and Orchard Lake Road. On the right is a 1920s summer home in Pleasant Lake Highlands. Apple Branch provided summer boarding on Upper Straits Lake. Camping and summer homes were enjoyed. Canoeing was also enjoyed. Fishing was always a favorite activity as well. <coughs> Growing up here, how did you spend your free time? Young people came to, I'm sorry, young people came to more than three summer camps in West Bloomfield. From 1906 through 1962, the Detroit Fre Free Press ran the Fresh Air Camp which gave underprivileged Detroit children an experience of two weeks of recreation in the countryside. The camp provided plenty of food and wholesome activities with many fond memories created. 
Camp Tanigo was on Long Lake Road, east of Orchard Lake, and provided a wholesome atmosphere for children living at the Detroit Protestant Children's Home. Campers would walk to Orchard Lake for swimming. With the English Industrial Revolution starting in the 1830s, mills were notorious for their poor working conditions. Mrs. M. E. Townsend recognized the girls who had been shipped off by their families to work in the newly organized mills were in dire need of support. She founded the Girls' Friendly Society and adopted the mission of providing wholesome vacation opportunities for these girls. Many European girls were brought to the United States to tend shops, such as Hudson's and Sibley's in Detroit. A group of ladies from Grouse Point formed the Detroit branch of the Girls' Friendly Society. From 1895 through the 1950s, Pine Lake housed the Girls' Friendly Society's Holiday House. In the summer of 1903, 42 girls, shop girls, moved to the brand new Holiday House. Here are day camp activities illustrated by a camper. The girls enjoyed many activities, swimming, tennis, reading, sewing under the trees or on the porch, floating on the lake in the moonlight, singing songs, dancing, playing cards, picnics, croquet, costume parties, and masquerades. Boating was a favorite activity. Automobile factory workers pooled their money to buy a site on Sylvan Lake for a boat club, and in 1916 built the boat club pictured in the upper left photo. Then in 1934, 22 die-hard sailors broke away from the noisy motor-oriented Oakland County Boat Club and formed the Pontiac Yacht Club with only sailing memberships. A group of automobile pioneers and leaders of government and industry formed a motorist club and by 1910 built a destination clubhouse. The group later became the Automobile Club of Detroit, and the clubhouse became the Pine Lake Country Club. By the mid-1920s, this area saw country club growth. Aviation Country Club began in 1924. Later, it was the Green Lake Country Club, and then was broken up for sub for a subdivision at the start of World War II. Tam O'Shanner Country Club's track of rolling wooded land was leased by a group of wealthy Detroiter industrialists in 1925. Knollwood Country Club was established in 1925, and Orchard Lake Country Club was established by Willard Ward in 1926. Twin Beach Country Club provided a nine-hole course by 1929, and Lake Comer Shenandoah Country Club began in 1968. By the 1930s, there were a few businesses. These were mentioned in the 1938 West Bloomfield Township Minutes. Iron Works, Crawford Door Sales, Sibley Coal and Supply, Kego Hardware, Detroit Steel Products, and Gabriel Steel Products. Built in 1939, Stainless Ware was on the southwest corner of Walnut Lake and Drake Roads and manufactured stainless pitchers, pots, and auto trims. The left photo is of downtown Kego Harbor on Orchard Lake Avenue looking east showing Kego Hardware and Kego Drugs. Interestingly, 30 subdivisions are listed in the 1938 West Bloomfield tax book. A copy of these pages is available to look at afterwards along the wall. 
The 1930 map designates the paved roads with a line of circles. They are Pontiac Trail, Commerce, Maple, Orchard Lake Road, paved in 1909, Long Lake, and Cass Lake Road. One stoplight was at Maple and Orchard Lake Road. Seven roads have different names in 1930. Hagerty was Novington, Drake was Hatton, Middle Belt was West Bloomfield, Inkster was South Bloomfield, Pontiac Trail was Wald Lake, and Commerce was Pontiac Commerce. 14 Mile was North Farmington Road. What were the area landmarks when driving? The 1930 map shows two post offices. The office on Walnut Lake Road just east of Middle Belt and North Farmington Post Office on the northeast corner of 14 Mile and Farmington Road. In 1938, the West Bloomfield Township Board gave approval to Detroit Edison to, to erect power lines and poles for the transmission of electricity for public and private use. This post office shown was on the Orchard Lake Schools campus in the 1990s. My Aunt Margaret would go to Pontiac once a week, and then we also got groceries in Kiko Harbor. But she went to Pontiac, and that was a whole day thing, and she would have a list of things that she got in Pontiac. Pontiac was a lovely city at that time. They had a, they had a department store called Waits, and it was a, a very nice store. Yes, a um, really wonderful hardware store. And uh, it was just a little town, um, yes. Yeah, they had a the couple of grocery stores, AMP and I think, I think Kroger's. Uh, good meat market, barber shop, um, and a restaurant there too, I believe. Weren't the stores that there are now, of course. They went down to Wilkins Corners for gas. <laughs> Yeah, everybody went down to Wilkins Corners. It was well known. When we visited my, uh, my mother's parents in Detroit, we would come out Northwestern Highway on our way home. And when we saw the store, Stonefront Garage, we knew we were almost home because that was the start of Orchard Lake Road. Joe DeConnick's wife, I can't remember her name, but and she ran a, a hamburger stand right next to the Stonefront Garage. Yes, yes. What happened on weekends in the summer, and I think probably all the families that had farms, your relatives from Detroit would come out. And that's on Sunday you'd watch to see who was coming because there was always somebody, a relative, coming out to just enjoy being in the country. As the number of residents increased, there was a need for further civic development. In the 1920s, the West Bloomfield Police Department was organized with one officer who patrolled the township on motorcycle. With the hard times of the Depression, it became necessary to hire the first full-time police officer in 1933 and then two additional in 1938, nine, sorry. In 1926, the fire department organized with nine volunteers and was located in Kego Harbor. 
The first chapel in West Bloomfield Township began as the Orchard Lake Community Church and was finished in 1874 with summer services only. Our Lady of Refuge Parish began in 1909. In 1938, a group from West Acres asked us asked to use the Orchard Lake Chapel for their non-denominational Sunday school with 65 to 100 people. This change was well received. The entire 1939 Orchard Lake Chapel brochure illustrated on the right is available to look at afterwards. Four towns received its name because it is near the point where the, town, where the townships of West Bloomfield, Commerce, Waterford, and White Lake meet. In 1866, a frame school house was built on the land donated by Nathan R. Colvin. From that year until 1930, the building served as both a school and church. Ooh. West Bloomfield Township formed in 1838. After a board building town hall, a brick building was built in 1928 as a municipal office and a community center. This is now Regent Street Senior Living. Sorry. By 1927, Orchard Lake was an independent village. In 1938, the Orchard Lake Hotel was reduced in size and rebuilt as the Orchard Lake City Hall. Many Kego Harbor men worked in Pontiac factories, such as General Motors, Baldwin Rubber, Truck and Bus, and Fisher Body. Kego Harbor became a city in 1955. Sylvan Lake, incorporated as, incorporated as a village in 1921, and a village hall was built in 1927. Sylvan Lake became a city in 1947. The Great Depression slowed development, and many local people grew enough food to sustain themselves. Unemployment in the U.S. was 19%. The auto industry was especially hit, so there were many layoffs. Westacre's development was a housing project addressing these issues. In 1936, U.S. Senator James Cousins pooled $550,000 of his own money with $300,000 of federal funds to establish this neighborhood of 150 homes for low-income automotive factory workers. Home ownership included an acre of land and encouraged farming for food and self-sufficiency. Oakland Housing Incorporated also assisted residents to develop satisfactory communal life and, a finance, and finance supplemental enterprises. Community Library Service was originally conceived, housed, and established in the, by the Kego Cass Women's Club in 1934. Four years later, it became a township-supported function and moved to the fire station. Township minutes note that a group wanted to play basketball in the fire hall was advised that they couldn't play on the days or evenings when the library was open. By 1939, the library moved to the town hall basement. In the 1930s, Westacre volunteers collected and donated books for the community library, housed in their clubhouse loft. It was so successful that by 1940, they asked the township to take over to assure adequate funding. By the 1920s through 40s, school districts as we know them today were formed, although some small districts remain. Seven school dis districts now serve the West Bloomfield area. Birmingham, 
Bloomfield, Farmington, Pontiac, Wald Lake, Waterford, and West Bloomfield. Oops. Pine Lake School, 1828 through 1948, was the first one-room school in the area in 1928. In 1916, electricity was installed in the school. In 1932, a basement was dug under the school and a furnace and bathrooms were installed. Pictured here is the entire student body of this one-room school. Scotch schools. After using a log school from 1829 through 1853, a board building from 1853 to 1926 is shown here. A brick building was built in 1926 and, and used until 1989 when a new building opened. Early on, all families were Scotch except one. Whitfield School, 1852 through 1947. After two wooden buildings, a third school was built of bricks in 1929. The second Whitfield School is pictured on the right in 1919. Green School. From 1866, a one-room school served the educational needs of District 6 students for many years. Until the 1940s, much of the area was still farmland. Children walked to school. There were new, no school buses in those days. Green School. Those east of Orchard Lake Road would cut through the Green's apple orchard and were told by their parents never to pick apples off the trees. And they didn't. Walnuts Lake School. It's believed that the Walnut Lake School formed in 1872. In, early, in the early 1930s, a larger school was necessary and a brick building was built. Walnut Lake School. The small brick school was slid on railroad tracks from the south side of Walnut Lake Road to the north side, to the north corner of Eastman Road, where it is still stands today, though somewhat altered, and is now Maria's Italian restaurant. Pontiac Central High. Families had to pay for, for high school education and provide their own transportation. Students sometimes walked to Pontiac. Kego Harbor School was built in 1914. After Roosevelt was built, the old Kego, Kego Harbor School was still being used for grade school when needed and other community activities. Roosevelt School opened with only one grade per room in 1920, K through 10. Then from 1922, another grade was added yearly. The first Roosevelt class graduated in 1925 because at first there were not enough students to hire 11th and 12th grade teachers since youth in those days often left school to work on the family farm or in factories. By 1938, enrollment included upper classes and 28 students graduated. They had a city hall on um, Orchard Lake Road, and it served also, they had a Sunday school there that I went to, and outside of the door there were two um, mulberry trees. I don't know if their trees are still there or not. I know the entrance is no, it's blocked off, but uh, that was the entrance, and uh, I used to eat the mulberries, I remember that. <laughs> My first day of school, I, um, I was so excited about going, and at that time we didn't have indoor plumbing. So um, there were girls that, whose job was to fill up this copper tank in the back of the room. 
and they, they were out pumping the water and there were people sitting around there and I was so excited to be one of them and they were talking about going to Sunday school and I said, well, I'm gonna go to Sunday school. And they said, you can't, you're a Catholic. <laughs> I never heard that word before in my life. So I kept it ringing in my head because I needed to ask my mother when I got home. And I said, Mom, am I a Catholic? And she said, yes. And she laughed and laughed, so I thought it was something that wasn't bad. Yeah. Yeah, the Green School covered a good bit of the area around there from almost to Middle Belt, all the way over to Pontiac Trail, west uh, up to Shenandoah. Uh, not too far south. Uh, they went to Hodner School. There was a path that went through the orchard. I, I always thought it was for us, but it was probably for other things too. And then we cut across Howard Green's lawn. We'd go across his lawn, down his driveway, and then across Green Road to the school. The one-room schoolhouse was on the corner of Middle Belt and uh, Long Lake. And I know that the school teacher from the little schoolhouse lived at our house, boarded at our house. Mm -hmm. So. For a week or a month? The whole season. It was ideal. There were only 28 kids in the eight grades. So there was a lot of personal attention to each child. It was something special. If we had a school board, it was Don's father, Howard, my father, Albert Doherty and Fred Portis, who owned the farm where the high school is. And they were the um, school board, and they chose that people would apply, and they would decide which one would be the teacher. We were fortunate. Dad was on the school board, and he and I would go Christmas to find a Christmas tree for the, for the Christmas tree. Every Christmas they had a uh, program the kids put on, practice for it for the first month before that, and it was crowded and hot, and uh, everybody crammed in there. Every spring we would have a spelling bee. It was something that we looked forward to. We had um, three, Miss Durkee, Miss Bowman, and um, you know, there were three judges that were sitting there. If you misspelled it, you'd, you'd, they'd go <laughs> Just like, it would hurt them as much as it hurt you if you spelled it wrong. This concludes a look at, at Greater West Bloomfield in 1938. Thanks for your attention. And for more information, additional resources are available. More than 1,600 historical photographs are available at the West Bloomfield Library website, and over 5,000 historical images and documents are available at gwbhs.org. And finally, thanks to Don Green, Jane Stack, and Marge Newell for their interviews. Thanks to Jim and Gwen Cherfoli, Helen Jane Peters, Kyle Stalter, and Sue Williams for their assistance, and thanks to Dave Scott and Civic Center TV staff for their support, interviews, and technical assistance. And we have time for a few questions. We've covered a lot of ground. Uh, several mentions were made of Wilkins Corners. Mm -hmm. Where was that and who was Wilkins? Wilkins is a person, and his family was there, and they own this store. If you come into the museum right now, we have a, an exhibit about them, and it was on the corner of Pontiac Trail and Orchard Lake Road, I think. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Or a little bit south of there? It's the beige building at Pontiac Trail and Orchard Lake Road on the east side. So that's the building that's still there. It used to be the meeting house back in the 80s. It's been a lot of different things. It was a, it, actually it was called 
it was a restaurant. And the Wilkins family, after the last one who was alive, was living upstairs after it became like the meeting place. It's gone a half a dozen. But actually, it was a Wilkins and they had a restaurant there, so I don't know if you know any more than that. Well, there's only one left, and she lives. Um, oh, you got to hold the microphone. There's only Betty. one Wilkins left. Ellen, is it Eleanor? I don't know. <laughs> Any uh, the youngest one. But it was a, a great family, and when people needed help on the island, they would ring a bell, which we have in the museum, and one of the Wilkins would go row over and help them out. <laughs> They had penny candy when we moved here. It was, uh, and they had a lot of Indian themes. The Indian was in front of the restaurant. Have you, do you know the Indian? We have part of it at the museum. Well, they commissioned this Indian up north, and it was about eight feet tall, so how to get it down here? They put it in the back of a pickup truck, and people were whooping and hollering all the way down <laughs> with this Indian standing there <laughs> coming from up north. There were two Indians, I guess. And if you travel like down Orchard Lake Road, you say, oh, you turn left at the Indian. That yeah. was Wall Lake Road, which is Pontiac Trail. And it was a great family, a great restaurant, I guess. So again, the exhibit's at the museum, and um, it's a nice exhibit. And interestingly, a couple Wilkins descendants came and enjoyed seeing it. So it's always fun to keep local history alive. Other questions? Sure. Uh, hi, my name's Chris Crossley. Mm -hmm. um, the nearest main road to where we live is Middlebelt. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that during the presentation you said that that name had changed to Middlebelt. Mm -hmm. I wonder when that happened and indeed why it happened. Why is it called Middlebelt? I cannot tell you why it's called Middlebelt. I can tell you that on the 1930 map that I looked at, the name was different, but when it changed, I can't tell you that either. The interesting thing about history is if you ask one question, then you ask more, and there's more and more and more, and at some point you have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> and I could only go so far, but that's a great question. You could look at the 1896 map that I also have and see what it's called then. And it's, just, it's a fun detective project. Mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, good evening. My name is John Balser. And I was curious about the hotel that was on Pine Lake on Interlochen. Was it called the Interlochen Hotel? Or, and from what years did it operate? When did it start and when did it uh, close? Wouldn't, might you know that? I don't know that. I believe it was called the Interlaken Hotel. So my husband and I were, or I, my, I read this to my mom last night, and she said, oh, Interlochen, like up north. Interlochen, Interlaken, what's the sim? I can't even tell you about that, but. It was a hotel there. It was wood, it burned. We have pictures of it, um, of Michigan Military Academy students lounging in front of it. So it was another destination hotel for Detroiters to come out to. It was private, it was private. Oh. Yeah. Yep, uh, Kara Kazanowski from Orchard Lake, it was a, it was a private club. It was never it was, a hotel? It was, it was a hotel, but it was only for members. Oh, right, and there's right. information on it in one of the um, wayside signs that are now up. Uh, it would be, are, the wayside signs are now installed on the West Bloomfield Trail. And are they available also on our website? They are. They are, um, yeah. Kara, Kara helped work on these uh, wayside Sorry. exhibit signs. And this is a whole project and, um, through, that I mentioned through uh, Motor City's National Heritage Project. And the West Bloomfield area has 20 of them. And we're very excited by that. And so we've posted them all on our website, gwbhs.org, and they scroll by. And so you can easily look at them or download them, I believe, um, to learn a lot of information. As you can tell, a lot of my information came from those slides because they're just a wealth of photos and information. Well, I guess that concludes our um, presentation. Oh, another question? Or, Did you uh, want to know more about the Motor Cities Project? 
talk to Ron Gay because he did a lot of the research. That well, he, regarding West Bloomfield, I mean, there are, I think there's 25, but there's some on West Bloomfield uh, Trail, which deal with the inner urban. There's two on the trail that deal with Pine Lake Country Club. There's one on there for the Countryside Improvement Association, which mm -hmm. is a ladies' organization from around 1911, I think, or 1906. There's West Acres. There's two on West Acres that are on the West Acres property. And then Sylvan Lake has five. I think that's it. Kega Harbor is part of the West Bloomfield Trail. And then one on the Orchard Lake Museum. And then one so, on the West Bloomfield Trail, but I highlighted that in this. Yeah, so they're all well. up and out there. Why, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Our open house, we have monthly open houses, the second Sunday of the month from 1 to 4. Um, there we have all the wayside exhibit signs um, posted for you to look at. So they're available there along with our other items. And so thank you. Um, this, thank you for coming and watching. Um, this will be available through Civic Center TV, through their website and their other capacities. Um, thanks to the library for making this presentation possible.